Well, this is great. So I'm Jen Forby. I'm at Boise State. And this is a little bit of an update, but also kind of where we're going. So um, the, work, the local working groups were the first sort of group to fund this research related to sage grouse and diet quality. And so um, you guys sort of got all this research going. And I really thank you for this, the investment of both your resources and your time and a lot of your input. Um, both uh, the public and the, and the um, agencies have been really helpful in us formulating sort of my background, which is in, in nutritional and chemical ecology, um, to understand how wild things eat toxic plants, and then to make it sort of a management perspective to sort of help understand how this might be helpful in, in managing sage grouse. And so uh, the, this is sort of, I call it this, this herbivore's dilemma. So if you're going to be a plant eater, um, it's, it's pretty challenging out there. So even though there's lots of plants to be had, um, as you know, not all of it is, is, is equal. And so what herbivores are trying to do is get nutrition to be able to pay for movement um, and reproduction in, at least for those that eat sagebrush, in a very toxic environment. So sagebrush is, is not the best food that's out there. And, and this is a collaboration. So Marcella Fremgen is my new graduate student working on this project. And then this is also in collaboration with Jack Connolly with Idaho Fish and Game. And then um, this, is, this work has expanded now to um, a collaboration that's funded by the National Science Foundation um, in collaboration with UC Davis to do the reproductive effects of, of um, dietary quality for sage grouse. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and so, as you probably know, right, not all food is created equal. You'll see, um, see cattle and, and sheep and, and horses wanting to get food where um, they haven't been, right? And it's because there's a, there's a variety of quality. Um, and so, you know, if you feed them strawberries, and I think those are, those are um, bananas, right? They love that compared to something else. And so, and so there's a variety of quality that's out there. And so domestic animals do this, and wildlife do the same thing. So previously, I worked on little wood rats, and I've worked on koalas and possums. And there's selection that occurs occurs out in, in, in wild animals as well, and that there's certain plants, so these juniper plants are not being browsed, um, but the part of that juniper plant is, and then these are eucalyptus plants in Australia. The one in the, in the background hasn't been, been foraged on, and the one in the forefront um, has been browsed, and then you can see the little bit even from that plant that hasn't been consumed. And so animals are very selective in the things that they consume. And there's a variety of parameters that drive that. Um, most of it is they're trying to get as much protein that they can out of plants, and they're trying to avoid the toxins. And it's, it's because of these, so these toxins, plants are using them to keep animals from eating them, because they have no other defense, right? They can't run away. And so if they want to keep things from consuming them, they have to invest in these toxins um, in the plants. And so sage grouse are no, are no different. So um, you know, the punchline right, is that not all sagebrush is created equal. So you may have tons of sagebrush in your habitat, um, and it might be really great cover, um, but it may not be good food for sage grouse. And so because sage grouse consume in the wintertime and through the spring about 100%, 100% of their food is their, their diet is sagebrush. Um, it needs to not just be sagebrush. It needs to be good quality sagebrush in terms of dietary quality. Um, and that this, this sort of selection and diet, dietary quality um, occurs at a variety of different spatial scales. And so this was the work that you guys actually funded in the beginning. And I'll, I'll just remind you, because you've probably seen this part before, of this, this selection at various spatial scales. And then I'll go into our next steps, which is actually looking at how that might impact movement and reproduction of sage grouse. And so when you think about the sagebrush sea, right, and it's shrinking and it's being fragmented and things are happening to it, not all of it is actually tasty, right? Not all of it is palatable to, to sage grouse. Um, and part of that are these different chemicals. So this is sort of what we do in our lab. We try and identify all these different compounds. And so there's classes, these volatile things. So this is what sagebrush makes sagebrush smell the way it does. And there's 30 or so more um, volatile compounds. And these are just, there's a variety of each of these peaks is a different chemical. And so there's, there's a lot of chemical diversity that occurs. Some of those chemicals seem to be important. Other chemicals don't seem to be as important. And both sage grouse and pygmy rabbits seem to care a lot about both the concentration and the diversity of these different compounds that are in sagebrush. Um, and so it's a very, compared to other plants, sagebrush is, is extremely chemically diverse. Um, and so our objectives, based on this knowledge that animals are selective in terms of foraging and that plants have this variation both in protein and in these chemicals, um, was that our first objective was to measure selective foraging. So we predicted that, as we have found in the past, that grouse are going to be selected for the highest amount of protein and the lowest amount of toxins, and that they would probably be selecting, based on the um, research that's out there, moderate canopy cover and height. And it's possible that grouse can't get all of these things in one place, right? Um, and so they're going to have to be making trade-offs between safe cover and food, potentially, because if you were a safe place, 
and you were really tasty, you probably, as a plant, wouldn't exist very long. So it's likely that, that you can't find really good cover and really good high quality food all in the same place, which makes it very challenging if you want to um, manage and conserve for these types of traits that vary in sagebrush. Um, and so what's novel, so this is, this is what we've done in the past, and I'll show you some results from that, but what's novel is that we're actually going to be comparing across a season. So we started in November at a single site, and we've worked all the way through March to see if the diet selection shifts in these birds early in the winter versus coming into le lecking season and while they're lecking. Um, we're going to look at selection within very diverse patches. So in the past, we worked at um, Brown's Bench, which is dominated by black sagebrush, Artemisia nova. Um, and the sites that we're working on now, this is, um, we're calling it Raft River, but it's the Jim Sage area. It's very diverse. So within a single patch, single stand, um, if you would call it that, um, there might be three or four different morphotypes of sagebrush. And I'm calling them morphotypes because we haven't quite figured out what species they are yet. Um, morphologically, so we've even brought Roger Rosentreader out with us and tried to have him help us. So uh, morphologically, they're very different, and chemically, they're very different. And they're all sort of located in this very small area. And so it's very diverse patches. So what are grouse doing when they've got, sol they've got variation in species in front of them? Um, and then we've got a site um, near craters um, where we've got three-tip sagebrush. So anecdotally, I've been told that sage grouse don't like three-tip and that they won't eat it. Um, but we found birds all winter feeding on three-tip sagebrush. So, um, so this will be a new site to sort of get out, out, out from under only Wyoming big sagebrush and think about other species of sagebrush and whether or not the dietary quality of those plants are important for sage grouse. Um, the second objective is seeing how diet quality impacts the movement of these birds. Um, so what we're predicting is that um, sage grouse will move farther away from lex, so right? These birds show up, they display, they're trying to mate, and then they leave to go forage. And so what we propose is that grouse are moving farther away from lex to find higher quality food, and I'll give you our rationale for that in a little bit. And um, part of that has to do with when you used to have hundreds of birds at a lek, if everybody was feeding right on the lek edge, that might change the quality near the lek, and we think birds are actually traveling farther to get higher quality food. Um, and then our, let's see what happened here. All right, so then the third objective is that we think this dietary quality, given how selective these birds are, we think it's going to actually impact the reproductive effort. And so we're focusing on males because they're a little bit easier to measure reproductive effort um, in terms of them being on the lek. And so what we think is that males that forage at the highest quality patches, those males are going to have the highest display effort on the lek, and we're going to track that. All right, so th this is where we're doing most of our research. So here's Brown, Brown's Bench, where we did our research in year one, which this group has funded. And now this year, um, we worked at Raft River, which is also called the Jim Sage area. Craters is the other location. And then we've got a site now in Wyoming um, where we've got um, four animals. So we've got 51 animals that are collared here for tracking their um, habitat use and their diet selection, 16 animals here, and we've got um, four animals right now in this first year that we have collars on in Wyoming. Um, and so what's new, again, is between sites within winter, so we're comparing that Raft River to craters um, within a site among seasons, only at Raft River, and then between sites within that springtime. So springtime during the lek time, we're doing work in Wyoming and also at Raft River. Um, all right, so the first pr prediction of the selective foraging, I'll tell you what we've already found in, at the Browns Bench area. So what we do is we've got radio collars on the birds. We flush them in the wintertime. We then, I say we, but students get down on their hands and knees and find browsed plants. Um, so what we look for first are pellets. So this is kind of, this is tracks actually, and here's a fresh fecal pellet. So when we flush the birds, if there's snow, we look for tracks, which tell you which plants the birds are feeding on. If there's not snow, then it's a little bit more challenging. Um, but what you find are bite marks on the plants. And so you'll see perfect, nice green bites where the, where the birds have been browsing. And it's very obvious once you've spotted it. Um, it seems like you shouldn't be able to do this. And then when we show people, they go, oh, God, it's so obvious. So if you ever want to come out and see bite marks, I'm happy to, to take you out. Even Jack Connolly can see them. So he has, I don't know. He doesn't have very good eyes, I don't think. Um, at least he says he has. So we flush the birds. We find these browse plants. And then we sample the browse plants and then a paired unbrowse plant that's within a half a meter of either a pellet, a track, or a browse plant. 
And the reason we do that is because the bird was there. They could have fed on that plant. They didn't. It wasn't just that they didn't ever encounter that plant. So we have these paired browsed and unbrowsed plants. And then we have randomly sampled um, sites not associated with where we flush birds. So we can compare used sites compared to random sites in the habitat. So Brown's bench, what we found was that grouse are avoiding toxins at multiple scales. Um, so what we had at this site was that we had Wyoming, sagebrush, and dwarf, and it's not exactly separated in this way, but um, so we had dwarf, and I'm calling it dwarf, but it's black sagebrush at the site, um, and Wyoming at this habitat scale. Within the black, sale, black sagebrush, the dwarf, we had used patches and unused patches, and then within those patches, we had plants that were browsed and unbrowsed. So we had these different levels of selection that we could test why birds were in certain places in certain patches were you eating certain plants and what might be driving that? <coughs> and then we used, you know, or Graham did, uh, hierarchical information theoretical approaches, which I don't even know how to pronounce it properly, so um, I won't get into that. Um, and what we found is that relative to the random sites, um, they were using that black sagebrush much more than what was available, and they were not using Wyoming big sagebrush as much as was it, what it was available. So the only of all the, so there was on average, you know, 19 versus 36 of our 55 patches, and um, they only had used one Wyoming sagebrush site in terms of foraging, um, and the black sagebrush, 54 of them. So they were definitely being selective um, on black sagebrush, and the, the explanation that we're proposing for this is that the black sagebrush had fewer monoterpenes, so these are the volatile compounds in sagebrush, than Wyoming sagebrush, Black sagebrush also had less protein, so it wasn't protein that was driving it. We think it were these, these chemicals. Um, and it certainly wasn't high cover. So um, the black sagebrush had much lower cover. So black sagebrush, less cover, less protein, but also fewer chemicals um, of these toxins in it. Um, when you look at the, the browsed versus the non-browsed versus the random sites, what you see in terms of crude protein, that once they find these patches, right, they're selecting for the most crude protein. So this is just within the black sagebrush patches, not this doesn't include Wyoming. So they're selecting for the highest crude protein, and they're selecting for the lowest amount of these monoterpenes, the toxin concentration. And so they're, they're selecting, again, what they're looking for is food that has as much protein as they can have, but has the fewest amount of these toxins, these chemical defenses. So what's new is that we're going to be repeating this at these new sites. Um, so we flushed, let's see, 16 birds at Raft River from January 1st to February 15th, and um, 16 birds at Craters. Um, sorry, 51. This should be 51. 51 birds at Raft River and 16 at Craters. And so we'll be comparing at these two sites. And the Crater site is the site where we have some uh, three-tip sagebrush that the birds are foraging on in the wintertime. Um, and then. Uh, the new site is that within, that, um, within a site among seasons, we, we measured at this Raft River of these birds. We had 17 birds from November to December, 16 from January to, to February, and then another 16 from, from February to March. And some of those are repeats of the same individual, and sometimes it was different individuals that we, that we ended up flushing. And so we'll be analyzing these samples as well, doing the same thing to see whether or not protein or toxins are driving some of this selection. Um, so this is just a few pictures of this diversity of these morphotypes that we have found. Um, so here's what we defined as large Wyoming sagebrush. So it was greater than 55 centimeters, multiple stems, large leaves. Then in the same location, what you would have is medium Wyoming. So based on the leaf morphology, it was Wyoming sagebrush. And based on smell and taste tests that we do out in the field, we thought it was Wyoming. And then there would be our medium arbuscula. So this is low sage, or maybe it's being called little sage now, but it's arbuscula. Um, and they would be the exact same height next to each other, um, and, um, but definitely based on the leaf morphology, different species. And then there were these guys. Um, so we called them small arbuscula. Um, they were a single thick stem with a little stocky thing up on the top, and they were always less than 15 centimeters. They may just be young plants. Um, we're not really sure. Based on the chemistry, they're very different from their larger counterparts. So we're not really sure what those plants are. Um, but anecdotally, those smaller buscula, every time we found them at a patch, they were the things that were being browsed. 
Um, so just briefly, kind of what we're happening is that what we're finding is that diversity matters and having our buscula matters. So half of the available patches had our buscula in them, but every single one of the used patches had our buscula. So grouse were definitely using our buscula more than it was being that was available in the habitat. And then in terms of diversity, um, half of the patches had more than one mo morphotype throughout the, the, all the random sites, but they were using patches more frequently that had this diversity of different plants. And it's probably because now you've got a bit of cover, right? If big sagebrush is there, you've got cover. And then if you also have some low sagebrush, um, you also have a little bit of pr potentially good food. And so it may not just be about having the plant there, but having diversity of sagebrush being reseeded and putting out in these patches to make it good habitat quality for sage grouse. Um, this is some other preliminary data. So this is the UV fluorescence test that people do. And so this is just a picture of what it ends up looking like. So this is Wyoming sagebrush that does not fluoresce under UV light. And this is what the arbuscula looks like. Um, and so these are a class of coumarins. Um, and so we, we do a, a assay where we can actually quantify the amount of, of fluorescence that occurs. And here's the large, so this is mostly Wyoming sagebrush, so it actually does fluoresce somewhat, but not as much as that medium arbuscula. And then this is the small thing. So this is that small, single-stemmed critter <laughs> that we don't know quite what it is. And it definitely seems to have a different UV reflectance than the larger Wyoming does, so we're, we're going to get to that um, eventually. And this is if you just compare all the arbuscula versus all the Wyoming. Wyoming has less fluorescence than the arbuscula, which is consistent with people using this to classify sagebrush. All right. So that's what we've done in the past, and we're just continuing to do more of that research at different locations so that we're not biasing our, our, our um, results from black sagebrush locations. So we're, we've got lots more Wyoming sagebrush, we've got some arbuscula, and then we've got the three tip um, sites that we're looking at. And so now we want to say, well, all right, they're being selective, but what is that? does that really matter to grouse? And so we want to know whether or not diet quality influences movement and it inf influences reproductive success, with the key being that if you eat better, you can reproduce and do things better. And so we think that birds will either put in more effort to find good food, or if they end, if they get good food, that they will, um, that, that will actually result in higher reproductive effort. And so our predictions already said these. So how are we doing that? Um, so this has worked both in Wyoming and um, in, in, uh, in at, at the Raft River site. And so what we have, just this, this would be a lek, right? So birds show up at this lek. Um, we've got, we know who's there based on collars. Um, so some of our sites we actually have, uh, they're called accelerometer tags on our birds. And so what these are is that it tells you location. So it's the same thing that's on your, your if anyone has fancy phones, that tells you where you are and how to get to the next location. And it tells you whether you're turned left, right, or, or, or forward, and it tells you how fast you're moving. So we have accelerometers on, the, on these birds or a harness, a backpack style of a tag on them. And every time they arrive at the lek, that information gets uploaded to stations on the lek. Um, so we get to find out what the birds did the day before. So they'll arrive at the lek, they do their thing, then they go forage, then they go roost, they come back to the lek, and it downloads the information of where they were, how frequently they were feeding. So you can actually get, um, you can differentiate pecking versus walking versus running versus flying from these tags. So we can find out what these birds are doing when they leave the lek. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is go, is, is identify how far are they going. So what we're doing is we're measuring the dietary quality near the lek and then far away where the birds go. So we find out where they, where they went to forage, either by flushing them, if they have VHSF collars on them, or we use the satellite collars that we've got on them. Um, and we can then back calculate back to the lek and say, why didn't you just stay 100 meters away from the lek and eat here? And we think that this is going to be higher quality food than near the lek. Um, and the reason for that is, is that sagebrush responds uh, to browsing by inducing, increasing its chemical defenses. And so if you have a lot of birds feeding near the lek, which they do feed while they're on the lek, as long as they're not distracted by females, um, they will be feeding. And so by feeding on those sagebrush, it actually increases the chemical defenses on those plants. And so if you had big leks, right, that sort of buffer of, of plants getting browsed might get wider, larger and larger. And so birds might be forced to have to go farther away from a lek to find good quality food. 
All right, and then, so, so this is one of the examples. So these are the, these four birds that we have in Wyoming. So here's the lack. You can sort of see the like lighter colored patch. It's sort of a weird shaped lack, and so the birds arrive at these leks. Here would be their forage spot that they went to. So this was the bird number 84 came and foraged here. And then he roosted at that site. So foraging sites are an hour after they leave the lek till dark. And then roost sites are from dark until an hour before they arrive back, back at the lek. So I'm just going to walk you through sort of where this bird goes. And so here would be a forage site. And then we go back to the lek. And this is 100 meters off of the edge of the lek to say, why didn't you just feed near the lek? So here's bird number one. Here's 93, also goes to that site, but he went and foraged and roosted, and they're pretty close to one another, so maybe foraging and roost sites are actually equivalent. And then what happens, right? Oh, my goodness, is it working? Yeah, so here's 84, though. The next day, he foraged here, and he roosted way over here. Um, then the next day, here's 93. Here's his forage site, um, and then his... his um, I don't know, I can't see his other site now. But anyway, so you get, a, get the point that you could identify where these birds are going. So here's two different birds over two days in a row where they went um, and what they were using. So it's kind of diverse. They're not just going to one location. They seem to be kind of spreading out. Um, and so we're going to be able to measure what's, what the, both the, the habitat quality in terms of structure is at both forage sites and roost sites and um, the dietary quality. And at most of the roost sites, we couldn't find browse plants. So they seem to not be feeding when they're roosting, which they're sleeping, so that kind of makes sense. Um, but that's sort of interesting that they don't seem to be feeding right before they come back to the lex, though, because we couldn't find browse plants at these roost sites. Um, so uh, what is happening is you might have, I sort of showed you, right, so 93 went this way. and and 83 went the other way. And so these birds are dispersing. They're going to different locations when they leave the lek. Um, and so what we're going to measure is dietary quality at those foraging sites. And then we observe the birds' display rates on the lek relative to how close they are to another male, how close they are to a female. And what we're proposing is that the males that forage in better spots will be able to display more for the ladies um, when they arrive. And so why do we think that? Well. Reproductive season is really expensive for these animals. So here's struts per day for a male, and here's the energetic cost of these birds. And so it's four times, they're expending four times more energy when they display than when they don't display. So this is really expensive. And what happens is, so correlated with higher reproductive success is a higher strut weight rate for males. Higher energy expenditures, right? So if they're strutting more, they're expending more. But those birds that strutted the most lost the least amount of weight. Those birds also traveled, so this was a study done by Berenkamp in 1989. The birds that strutted the most, were the most successful and expended the most energy, also traveled the farthest away from the lek, and they didn't lose weight. So anybody who's come in on a diet, if you're exercising a lot and you're not losing weight, what are you doing? <laughs> probably eating poorly, right? You're, you're eating lots of high energy, high fat foods. And so we think these birds are paying for this greater cost by eating at higher quality sites. And so those are the pieces that we're going to put together soon. Um, all right, so same thing that we do. We're going to be, um, we started this in mid-March at these two sites in Wyoming and one in, in Idaho. Um, we observe these collared birds. We have a time budget, amount of time spent on the lek, populations both with females and potentially cow pies, because um, they do do that, um, their display rate. And then we also perform lek counts to account for hen presence. Um, and then we follow them to those off lek sites. And this is just an example. So we have actual stakes put up on the lek so we can identify where birds are relative to females on the lek through video cameras, recordings that we're doing. Um, and so our next step is um, we've got about 450 plant samples to analyze. So that's what we're doing all summer in the lab. Um, we'll be measuring those monoterpenes, the amount of protein, the coumarins, those, vol those um, fluorescent compounds. Um, we're conducting habitat transects right now to measure cover um, uh, and structural characteristics out in the field. Um, we're measuring a bunch of behavioral videos from the LEX. Um, and we'll be beginning data analysis this summer. And so the implications with this work are not only to sort of identify what factors can influence reproductive success. And although we're focusing on the males, 
Um, what's good for the right gander is good for the goose. It goes the other way around, but right, it should be about the same, right? So if males are doing better by eating in good spots, we 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 sort of are, would propose that females are are being equally selective. Um, so and and so what we can also do is impact then uh, identify the impact of different management um, strategies and climate change. So we've got a study in Oregon measuring the effects of juniper removal on dietary quality of sagebrush. We've got a um, study in Wyoming uh, where they've got both mowing and herbicide treatments that we're measuring the effect of those treatments on dietary quality of sagebrush. Um, certainly we could be looking at fire and drought and identifying how those factors, those, those climate um, factors might influence dietary quality. And so what we're proposing, if we can find what makes a site palatable for grouse that then results in reduced energetic costs and higher reproductive success, that that can help us with some of the management strategies um, in terms of prioritizing conservation. So again, it's not just about having sagebrush, at least in the winter and springtime, it's also about the, the dietary quality of that sagebrush. And so tons of people have helped with this and I thank them and I thank you and I'd be happy to answer questions about where we've been and where we're going. Thanks. Thank you. And like the black sage, is that anything? Yeah, we get at that, and then we've got the random sites to sort of say, right. is right. this better than what is actually available? Right. That that um, Jim Sage area is really really interesting, though. I mean, it like it was amazing how diverse, and and we had one of our flocks in the winter was 100 plus birds, um, so it's in the Lexer relatively large. There's a couple that sort of are in a lot of cover too, and so I don't know, I'm sure Fish and Game probably has those numbers of let counts at those sites, but um, certainly the flocks in the wintertime are big, and I think they come from multiple places. Um, so they've got some, some of the satellite callers are on those birds, and so we'll get to see how far they go and, and when they come back. So, so this is overlapping with um, Courtney and um, Karen's study in terms of the effort going into collaring all those birds. We're just piggybacking on top and saying, all right, let's look in the winter with these same birds that you put all this effort into to collar them and catch them and, and find out what they're doing off sort of breeding season. Right. Yeah. Do they feed on the seed of the sagebrush plant or just strictly the leaves? I don't think they do the because the, it seeds. Um, so yeah, so those inflorescent stalks that are there, we rarely see those clipped. Um, so I don't think they're doing that. Um, and on the, so I've got, we got um, about 11 grouse carcasses from, from falconers, and we dissected those crops and gizzards, and it's all leaves. There's nothing else in there but, but leaves in those crops. So I think in the wintertime, that's all they would. There's still the fluorescents that are up there, but, but maybe when it actually seeds, they might eat the seeds, but I, I'm not sure. The seed is the higher protein, so you think yeah. that's what they would so, so this is sort of interesting too. So because we tracked those birds at that um, Raft River, so they, they tended to not like the Wyoming as much. So those would be more frequently, we wouldn't find browsed Wyoming, but we'd always find that small or buscula, whatever that thing is, being browsed. But as we got into the later spring when the ephemeral leaves came out, we started seeing the Wyoming being browsed. So it might be something in the, in the ephemeral leaves. So we did um, studies where we summertime plants, we separated ephemeral and persistent leaves of, on the same plant, and the ephemeral leaves have more nitrogen, more protein, and less chemical, fewer chemical defenses and more water than those persistent leaves that it would be all winter. So it's almost as if when those ephemeral start arriving, then the birds can have a greater selection of food to be able to feed off of, yeah. So, and it might have also been that, that um, you know, it was getting hot, so when they're lecking, this is a pretty energetically expensive time, they're expending a lot, they're heating up. When they go to flush, that, that's when that cover might become even more important because it's certainly cooler. So when we flush birds, when we would see browsing, it was always on the shade side of the plants. Um, so we started taking note of which side of the plant we saw browsing. So they're feeding in the sort of shade, so they're getting to eat and have some thermal protection at the same time. So yeah. anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs>